the book uh, The Compassionate Life. My religion is kindness. From the moment of birth, Every human being wants happiness and freedom and wants to avoid suffering. In this, we are all the same. And the more we care for the happiness of others, the greater our own sense of each other becomes. Many of our problems are created by ourselves based on divisions due to ideology, religion, race, resources, economic status, and other factors. The time has come to think on a deeper, more human level and appreciate and respect our sameness as human beings and to have a respect for endangered cultures that share these principles. We are at the dawn of an age in which many people feel that extreme political concepts should cease to dominate human affairs. We should use this opportunity to replace them with universal human and spiritual values and ensure that these values become the fiber of the global community that is emerging. It is not possible to find peace with anger, hatred, jealousy or greed. At every level of society, familial, tribal, national and international, the key to a happier and more peaceful and successful world is the growth of compassion. We do not necessarily need to become religious, nor even believe in an ideology. We need only to develop our good human qualities and know that love and compassion are the most essential concepts for human survival. So long as human beings live and suffer, the only world open to our present knowledge, the brotherhood of man, will seem an unattainable principle. In order for us to achieve real, lasting peace among one another, the effort to realize that noblest and most satisfactory moral value must be occupation, the occupation of every individual intelligence. Thank you, Nicholas. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My husband was raised Jewish and I was raised Methodist. And our kids have been raised Christian, Buddhist, and Jewish. And when I'm asked, what is my religion? Well, I often say a word that I made up, I'm enthusiastic. And people say, what does that mean? And I say, I include everybody. I grew up traveling because my father was an engineer, and we moved almost every year of my life. I was born in Idaho, but lived in Oregon, Washington, California, Michigan, Florida, Belgium, and Italy. And then I moved to New York at age 20. Change is not scary to me. I learned early on to embrace and accept different cultures and lifestyles. And I was exposed to people of many different backgrounds. And I feel very fortunate for these experiences because they define who I really am today. It may seem that when I say enthusiastic, it means that I am tolerant of other religions. But to be tolerant just means to tolerate. To merely tolerate something is to put, it, is to put up with it or to endure its existence. 
But to me, enthusiastic means that I am not tolerant of other religions. I celebrate them. I embrace them. At the basis of all religions, there are undeniable similarities. There is a philosophy of spirituality that views each of the world's religious traditions as sharing a single metaphysical truth or origin. And this is called perennial philosophy. The British writer Aldous Huxley wrote a book about it, and it's called The Perennial Philosophy, and he wrote that in 1945, which is a comparative study of mysticism. In this book, he presents the highest common factor of all theologies in an attempt to show that they are essentially the same at the core. It is a human nature to try to find similarities or things in common in order to better understand something outside our own scope of knowledge. Perennial philosophy does not claim that all religions or spiritual traditions are the same, but rather that the human search for truth is perennial. Many religiously tolerant people invoke the perennial wisdom philosophy as a reason for their tolerance. When doing so, they interpret the perennial philosophy as a way to connect different and opposing philosophies to one underlying idea of faith. Or they see it as a philosophy that claims that there is a single common religious principle behind all the world's religions. However, the idea that religions are essentially the same is not the crux of perennial philosophy. It is not meant to be used as a way of comparing or combining religions. Perennial philosophy does not claim that all religions or spiritual traditions are the same. Rather, that the human search for truth is perennial and is a common human condition of different people of diverse beliefs and in diverse circumstances. The basis of perennial philosophy is the common search for truth, which is not restricted to only one religion or to religion at all. For example, the search for truth is also embodied in science. We seek truth through the scientific method. We propose a hypothesis and attempt to prove or disprove it through systematic observation, measurement, and experimentation. Then our conclusions must be verified by others using the same methods. The last step is especially important because we know that humans have biases that can make them see things the way they want to see them, based on their own preconceived notions or experience. In order to reach a truthful conclusion, we have to seek further verification from others. I don't think there's an instance in the history of science when all scientists agreed. As such, the search for scientific truth is an ongoing search. Science never rests, and our scope of knowledge continues to be refined and improved. Pick any subject in science, astronomy, chemistry, physics, biology, or any of the others, and we will find that what we believe today varies considerably from what we believed a hundred years ago, or even fifty years ago. We come ever closer to the ultimate truth, but we never quite reach it. Truth itself evolves based on our understanding of the world around us. This is true of science and even more true when it comes to philosophy. There is far more disagreement in philosophy than in science because of its intangible nature. There may be a dozen theories of gravity, but there are hundreds of philosophies of ethics or religion. So what is the purpose of searching for a truth that is so hard to prove? In science, the answer is that it provides us with technology and the end result which we see. And we use it every time we pick up our phones, every time we use our computer, I have minimal scientific understanding of electricity, but I flick a switch on and I no longer live in the dark. Scientists may never agree on the tenets of classical physics or the laws of quantum mechanics, but we put people on the moon and we watch it on television. What does a pursuit of truth and philosophy provide us with? It isn't something that we can necessarily see, hold, or touch, but it provides us with a map. It is a spiritual compass, a tool for navigating life. 
philosophy and religion is included in this, points us to the higher meanings and purposes of life. It makes us consider the nature of our world and ourselves, the nature of our consciousness and the relationships we have with nature and each other. It attempts to, to provide us with a coherent viewpoint from which to see the significance of our lives and of all of life. It links us to the past, the present, and the future. So there are many reasons to refer to the perennial philosophy and how things change over time as our knowledge evolves. Because of the internet and other technological marvels, we are exposed to cultures in a way that would astonish our ancestors. Not long ago, people rarely traveled far from their home or hometown. Now we find ourselves in a global economy and a connected world, so we have access to people and ideas that were not available to us before. In the past, people were very leery of strangers. Our ancient caveman ancestors traveled in bands of less than 100 people, hunting for food and gathering edible plants. They had to roam over very large areas to sustain even such a small amount of people. Therefore, it was somewhat natural to see strangers as competition for the small amount of available food and resources. In today's global market, where for many food and resources are abundant, we don't have the same issues. So it makes sense that in the current world situation, where we are exposed to diverse peoples and diverse beliefs, we are interdependent and need to get along with others. This is a learning process. If we are going to teach a difficult subject, we start off with what people already know and build from there. We introduce one small different and unknown fact at a time until finally a person knows something that they knew nothing about before. We start with the known and we move into the unknown. Therefore, it makes sense that our first inclination is to look for similarities. That's why we are drawn to believe all religions and all peoples are essentially the same and worthy of the same respect and equality. And this is certainly not a bad idea, especially as a starting point. But this is one side of the coin and a valuable piece of currency. But for me, I am fascinated by the other side of the coin, the differences. I don't use a perennial, perennial philosophy as part of the reason that I call myself enthusiastic, even though the search for truth is something we all have in common. Our similarities are only a very small part of the reason this term makes sense to me. I came to the idea about being enthusiastic by something which I learned from my father, father and mother, something called a sense of life. This is not something attained through the study of any philosophy or social science. It is the basic innate understanding of essential virtues and ideas and how they are expressed uniquely by every individual in how we live our lives. This was not taught to me in words but picked up simply from the example my father and mother showed me by how they lived their lives. While I acknowledge and rejoice in the things we share, I am most fascinated and excited by our differences. Yes, we are the same in many ways, especially in our intrinsic value and the fact that we all deserve to pursue happiness in the way we feel we can best attain that goal. But every human being is still undeniably unique, regardless of the things we share, and that is fascinating to me. Human beings are not only different from one another, they are different from all other animals. Most animals are born with certain instincts. Nobody has to tell a robin to live in the trees or how to build a nest. And nobody has to tell any animal in the wild what they should eat. But for humans, these are learned behaviors. We don't all live in the same kind of structures. We don't all eat the same food, and we don't all believe the same things. Nothing is given to us automatically. We have to think and decide what is best for us as individuals. 
Because the idea of only focusing on the things we have in common can seem like a call for conformity, I firmly believe we have to rejoice in our uniqueness as well. Our differences, simply because they are different, do not make us better or worse than the next person. Our different and unique qualities do not inherently make us superior or inferior, but should be celebrated. I find it interesting that, for instance, Elizabeth Taylor has violet eyes. How different. For me, the differences among us are the most interesting and beautiful aspects of being human. But we are at our cores the same. Don't we all wish to be happy and free of suffering? How can we rationalize wanting that for ourselves and not want that for others? Most Asian philosophies are founded on the basic premise that we are all connected and interdependent. Buddhism is not alone in believing that selfishness leads us to an ugly and dysfunctional world. Even though no one overtly sets out to be selfish, we still live within the confines of ourselves, our families, our social circles, and sometimes we shut out the needs or suffering of those outside. Even if we cannot see someone else's suffering firsthand, we can still wish for them to be free of suffering, just as we wish for ourselves. Equanimity means treating all people the same way with impartiality. The monks demonstrate this every day in receiving people of all backgrounds and temperaments in the same way. They are free of judgment and impatience and self-importance. When confronted with a difficult person, they receive them in the same way they would a friendly one. Equanimity is our daily routine, and it's their daily routine. The essence of equanimity is impartiality, which enables the meaningful practice of loving kindness and compassion and empathetic joy. When we practice equanimity, we are wishing for all sentiment beings to be free of the causes of suffering and unhappiness, knowing that it is not possible unless we are all freed from the afflictions of the mind. When I was a child in school, I was taught that America was a great nation, a melting pot, because it was comprised of peoples of all nationalities from all over the world. Our country welcomes others. The Lady Liberty, a beacon for all newcomers, holds a plaque beginning with these words, Bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. I recognize at once that America was great specifically because we celebrate and accept the power of our differences. We have an infinite pool of talent from all over the world to draw from. That was and still is our greatest strength as a nation. You may remember I told the story of the pencil, which showed that it takes hundreds of people from all over the world with different nationalities, religions, politics, and beliefs to make a pencil that you can buy anywhere for a few cents. This is only one example of how diversity is a keystone for providing the components for a rich, full, and rewarding life. Every person has a story, literally. Every person knows something that you do not know, and that will make our lives richer. There are over 130 million books in the world right now crammed with information containing different opinions, perspectives, and philosophies. No one person can hold all this knowledge. Therefore, those holding different scopes of knowledge from ourselves can impart the most knowledge to us. So I don't just tolerate different religions and ideas being an enthusiastic. I try to celebrate them. Because every religion, every idea, anything different than I ever learn about or come in contact with adds infinitely to my life. Only by going outside our immediate circle of knowledge and comfort zones can we broaden them? I absolutely am captivated by the diversity of Earth, of life on Earth, which obviously does not stop with only humans. 
There are more than a million and a half species that we know of on Earth and many waiting to be discovered. And there are around a half a million species of plants alone. And even beyond living things, there are an infinite number of places and things to see that will enrich our lives and that of our children, friends, and family. In this current environment where divisiveness can be found in our media, politics, and global affairs, it is especially important to approach other people with different opinions with equanimity. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. When we embrace people and circumstances outside our comfort zones, we grow and evolve as a person. The recent royal wedding was a great example of diversity and inclusivity. It shows us that no matter how set in our ways or traditions, we can choose to be open, to learn and include others. Joy and pain are created by us, but with a just-like-me attitude, we can train our hearts and minds to be inclusive, realizing that everyone wants to be happy, healthy, and free from suffering. Because of the value that other people, other religions, and other ideas add to my life, I very enthusiastically want to incorporate and celebrate as much diversity as possible. That is why I call myself and enthusiastic. And with open hearts and open minds, we can all be enthusiastics, trusting that divine love and spirit will give us strength and support to open our hearts, our minds, to diversity and inclusivity. So let's pray. And in prayer we open our hearts to that great being, that divine self that's within us. We open our hearts collectively and we ask that we may be appropriate in our response to the things that we're concerned about. We particularly think of our world at the moment. We open our hearts to be appropriate to create a more inclusive world, a world where love is at the center of things a world where leaders wish the best for each other, a world where nations support each other. And we ask that we may be appropriate to that end result. We pray for all those who are in difficulty, particularly thinking of the families of the people affected in the duck boat disaster, people suffering from earthquake, from volcanoes, from natural disasters all around the world. We ask that we're appropriate to the situations of war zones that exist, people living in fear of their lives. Pray for all those in prison, in difficulty, Pray for all those in hospital. And coming closer to home, we pray for our valley. We particularly think of all those affected by the fires. We pray and ask to be appropriate in our response to that. We pray for the firefighters, for the pilots, for all those trying to save homes and lives. And pray for those who've been evacuated, who are finding difficulty breathing with the smoke. Pray for those who've lost their homes as well. 
Pray for all those visiting our valley at this time for the holidays, for the music festival, all those working around all the festivals and events going on. Pray for safety and joy. And finally, we do think of those who are close to home, who've been in difficulty, particularly think of Patricia Hill, think of Father Joseph Boyle, and particularly the family of Barbara Orcutt, David Floria's sister, who died recently. We open our hearts to your divine spirit and ask you to enable us to be appropriate to all these situations. Amen.